Planet Earth Week. Our green report today brought to you by SolarWorld.com. They manufacture solar panels. And in the context of what's green, Jeremy Wagoner is with us. GasholeMovie.com is the website. The movie is called Gas Hole, um, which uh, evokes all kinds of interesting... Um, at first, I, I, had, I had assumed, Jeremy, that this was following up on gas land and uh, on fracking, but you, the gas that you're talking about here is actually gasoline, right? Yeah, that's right. We're actually talking, uh, really looking more at uh, crude oil prices, the history of the, uh, the crude oil industry, uh, and the disconnect between uh, the crude oil market and actually what you're paying at the pump. Now, right now, uh, oil, crude oil, I haven't checked today. I've got an app on my phone. I can do it, but it's about 100 and what? Uh, what is this selling for? Around a hundred dollars? We're, we're, yeah, we're we're well above a hundred. We've been around a hundred six, hundred and ten. Yeah, okay. So uh, we're in, we're somewhere people. in that neighborhood. Um, how much are the you know Exxon Mobil and Shell and BP and these giant oil corporations that are reporting massive profits? I mean, so much so that we saw them. They actually lifted the stock market the day after Standards and Poor's said that they were going to downgrade the, the the U.S. because of the risk of the banks in part. Um, which everybody expected was going to crash the market by 500 points. Instead, it went up because of these guys all had these earnings reports. How much are they paying for oil? Well, the thing is, is they're not actually buying it on the crude oil market. So when that market goes skyrocketed, that's why they're, they're posting these huge profits, because they have long-term contracts with their partners where they drill the oil, or they just own the, the fields outright. So they drill the oil at, a, at what is essentially a fixed cost, they transport the oil, they sell it back to their own subsidiaries, and then they take it to the market. So then that crude oil market, when it's going crazy like this, their price is consistent, their cost is consistent, so their profits only go up when that price goes up. That's, uh, that's uh, pretty remarkable. You know, in the um, used to be that the movie companies that produced the movies also owned the retail theaters so if you wanted to go to an mgm movie you had to go to an mgm theater if you wanted to go to a warner brothers movie you had to go to a warner brothers theater this is back in the 40s and, and early 50s and uh and and sometimes only had one theater and so you could only see some movies and the movies you know the the, the the theaters got to own basically the actors they had them under contract the whole star system and the federal government came in and said this is vertical integration of a market this is a violation of uh, the, the in in if nothing else the Sherman Antitrust Act and you can't do this anymore and it led to an explosion of creativity and productivity for the movie market and a dramatic lowering of price of what it cost to go to a movie same thing happened with television in the 1970s and that led the first company in fact to step into the breach when when they said to NBC CBS ABC you can no longer solely manufacture the product that you retail through your TV stations, you have to buy from independent producers and allow them to participate, was Mary Tyler Moore and Mary Tyler Moore Industries and Stephen J. Cannell and Hawaii Five-0 and all these. Just, you know, it just led to this explosion. It seems to me like in the oil industry, we've got this exact same thing, vertical integration. They own everything from the, from the, from the hole in the ground to the retail gas station. How is that? Well, that's, that's exactly, it's exactly what we look at in the film. We look back at, at um, the rise of Standard Oil and the rise of Rockefeller. And what he had done is exactly what you're describing, is he completely took over the industry from when they pulled out of the ground till they take it, uh, take it to the pump. And then what happened is there's a remarkable, remarkable woman, uh, back at the time before women could vote, her name was Ida M. Tarbell, and she really exposed... Um, what Standard Oil had done, the really like the predatory business practices that they were doing to curtail competition, to buy out competitors and quash that. And she actually helped to, uh, she was, well, you know, in that muckraker movement, and she helped to break up Standard Oil. Then what happens is Standard Oil is broken up into these companies that we now think about, Exxon, BP, right. Chevron, Shell, all of these companies are actually sister companies because they used to be part of Standard Oil. Well, that was Teddy Roosevelt. He broke Standard Oil into 27 different companies. But but in the if if my recollection is right, sure. but in the 18 late 1880s early 1890s when when Rockefeller was doing his business out of Ohio, Ohio said what you're doing is illegal with the Standard Oil Trust. So he said, mm -hmm. "Okay, what state will change their corporate charter laws to make what I'm doing legal?" 
and you had this competition on the East Coast between Connecticut, New Jersey, New York, and Delaware principally. Delaware ended up with the least restrictive laws. New Jersey, however, ended up with John Rockefeller and Standard Oil. And, and, uh, and the consequence of this was that all the other industries were now able to vertically integrate just like oil had, and we had the, the, the rise of the barons. That's exactly what happened. And then when, when they actually broke up Standard Oil, all of the investors in Standard Oil got equal shares in all of the subsid the new companies. And so within a short period of time, they actually made more money off of the breakup uh, of Standard Oil than they would have. Which is the exact uh, same thing that happened up. when Jerry Ford and Jimmy Carter broke up AT&T, by the way. And, and so it happens over and over again. And then since that time, all of these... Um, you know, starting in the 80s, really, all of these companies have then begun to merge or back together. So they're mm -hmm. really starting to re-coalesce yep. and, and get back to that Rockefeller idea. Well, that's because uh, in 80, 82, that 83, Reagan stopped enforcing the Sherman Antitrust Act, and no president since then has enforced that law. Well, that's 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 where we're at, and that's one of the one of the topics that we really try and look at at the okay, film. Okay, a couple of seeing, couple of seeing how these companies really are still part and still so in, uh, integrated with each other. We're talking with Jeremy Wagoner. He is the co-director of Gashole, GasholeMovie dot com. You can find out, you know, uh, where, how, when, you know, uh, get the movie. This is a remarkable piece of uh, filmmaking narrated by Peter Gallagher, featuring Joshua jo Joshua Jackson. Um, you also talk about how the oil companies are buying up patents, manipulating gasoline supplies, intimidating inventors of green technology, that uh, we really don't need to be paying $5 a gallon for gasoline. In fact, we don't even need to be using gasoline. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Let me just throw it over to you here. for uh, we got about three minutes. Uh, we've, we really looked at a lot of different things. Um, one of the things that was fascinating to us, because my, uh, my co-directing partner and I, we really, we're just filmmakers. We're not activists. We're not... Um, you know, really that's necessarily even that socially motivated before we started the film. So as we were learning about this topic, you know, we, we've heard about the electric car, so and we've heard about hydrogen being the, the thing of the future. But one of the things that we had learned that I didn't know was that uh, Rudolf Diesel, when he built the diesel engine, uh, was before petroleum really had come on the market as a right. fuel. And so he had, uh, uh, when he displayed that, uh, diesel engine at the World's Fair, he used peanut oil. Right, it was and vegetable oil. he was a big oil, yeah. proponent of vegetable oils as fuel, and, and that idea of being, you know, this was at a time where where everything was local and sustainably grown because we didn't have this big infrastructure of transportation. Well, there was the, the one singular exception of whale oil, which was decreasing in supply, but right. your point right. is well made. But so then, so then this this is this idea that we're talking about about buying local, locally produced, sustainable. This is an old idea. Right. This is not a new idea. And and so then this this de as we were looking at it in California at the time, uh, they were starting to sell B ninety nine, which is almost a hundred percent biodiesel. Right. Uh, they had they were they were uh, opening up stations. There the biodiesel refiner was like adding jobs. There were new companies that were opening up. This was a really an, an exceptional boon. And what we found out, actually, that's not in the film, is there was a, one of the biggest shippers, um, diesel shippers in California, was doing a test run running this B99 in their trucks, and they were getting more, tur more torque, they were getting better fuel economy, they were getting um, more power in the trucks. And this is a, a domestically produced renewable energy source that runs in existing engines. So it's not something that we have to do. Right. If we just took this idea and we started producing this fuel and just... Yeah, just well, look at Brazil. Cars. Half of their cars now are running biofuels. I mean, it's, it's remarkable. Scott, uh, excuse me, Jeremy Wagoner. Jeremy, I'm sorry we're out of time, but uh, people can check it out. Gashole, H-O-L-E, movie.com. Thanks so much for, for the great work you're doing. 